high of antibiotic resistance compared to cancer. That is always the question, or oh, heart attacks be that. Now, a guy called Jim O'Neill, who used to be the head of Goldman Sachs, is a chairman of a big investment bank in Wall Street. He came up with a prediction. And you have seen this slide before, I know, because others have shown that. I just wanted to spill this a little bit with a bit of water. Macroeconomists don't know the future as much as we don't know the future, but they are very daring people, whereas epidemiologists don't dare. We always have to have p-values in order to exclude random error. They don't. They just go there and say, what? Under a couple of assumptions that we can make, this is going to be the future, and that is what he's been doing. And he says there will be 10 million people dead annually by the year 2050. And that will be a bigger problem than cancer, which answers the, uh, the question of the, um, uh, uh, of the ministers of health. Well, I put a question mark there because I think that is very broad brush and hand-waving arguments, but that is what macroeconomists are all about, aren't they? So I really want to focus the question a little bit more tightly. I'm using a map here, which is a resistant map, which includes the data that are available globally uh, by the Center for Disease Dynamics, um, Ecology and Policies. Of, uh, I don't know if you know Ramanan, Lakshman Narayan. He sits in India. He's a very, he's also a macroeconomist, but he, took, he takes a, a bit more careful stance. He develops these type of um, his group develops this type of, of maps where the dark colors indicate problems and the bright colors indicate no problems. Now, Brazil is not on here. It's just not because it doesn't have a problem, but because obviously uh, CDEP doesn't have the data from you guys. But my question is really if you put sort of like, if you think about antibiotic resistance as weather systems, can we actually make prediction if the monsoon that is down there in India will ever be able to come to Scandinavia, right? Is this clouds that move around? And how do these clouds move around? And I know, since I've been listening to talks yesterday, that you also have quite a bit of a rainy season here in terms of antibiotic resistance in South America. So this is not on this map here. So before we try to think how we actually can see the antibiotic resistance spread on a global scale, I wanted you just to give you some concepts of antibiotic resistant bacteria. That's very easy. Since you are a microbiologist, you know all about this. I want to divide bacteria into two types. One are the opportunistic bacteria or facultative pathogens, and one the obligate pathogens. Now, the opportunistic pathogens are obviously bacteria that dwell normally on our skin, in our guts, and actually are the E. coli, the enterococci, the staphylococci. And importantly, it's not only that I have them in me, that you have them as well. And wherever you go, if you go to Patagonia or to Alaska, if you go to Shanghai or go to the Netherlands, if you go to Arusha, everybody has more or less the same set of symbiotic bacteria in the gut. Hence, these bacteria are cosmopolitan. Opportunistic pathogens are not cosmopolitan. They are epidemic. They are the Salmonella, they are the Shigella, they are the Vibrios, they are the Yersinia. When you get them, you have a good chance that you get ill. These others don't cause illness unless your immune system or you're highly compromised. However, whenever you treat an obligate pathogen, you always treat the facultative pathogens with it. And that is the reason that on a large scale, globally, more of the normal gut flora is exposed to antibiotics than any of the obligate pathogens. Hence, resistance emerges in the obligate pathogens, in the facultative pathogens, not in the obligate pathogens. And only in the future we can expect that evolution brings resistance also to the obligate pathogens. And that is a worrying uh, um, a view, obviously. Okay. 
Now, the last line of antibiotic treatment options that we have in hospitals, and those among you who treat patients know that carbapenems have been developed in the 1970s, really, and hit the market in the 1980s, are really extraordinary good antibiotic drugs. They are better lactam antibiotics. They usually end on the ending of penem, so it's imi, mero, erta, or dori, penem. They have an enormously broad spectrum of activity, including anaerobes, including aerobes, including gram positives as well, but they're mainly used uh, for the treatment of gram negative that are already very drug resistant. So that is one of the last antibiotic treatment options. And finally, if you cannot use carbapenems, we have the polymyxins that have been developed in the 1950s. They are more like um, uh, detergents because they dissolve the outer membrane and they're really nasty drugs. And I always tell my students they are the next to get actually giving your patients domestos, if you, if you know what that is. It's a, a, clean, a, a cleaning agent with a disinfecting property. So carbapenemase production is a threat for our last line antibiotic therapy. You know that, and this is the data from Germany, that pretty much look like the data from, from Brazil. Only that the numbers are smaller, but the trends are equally worrying because you, obviously that OXA 48 here is just linearly increasing over time. And these are the number of cases in a country that has 82 million inhabitants. So you see, it's still a small problem, but it's an increasing problem, no doubt about that. Carbapenem resistant pneumonia in 1916, these are the latest data from the EAR system. The EAR system publishes the data from 2017 in November on the antimicrobial antibiotic awareness day, so that we don't have that yet. Shows you that carbapenem resistance is mainly confined to Italy, to Greece, where the problem is even worse. Romania is new to the map that, that picked up. And what you cannot see here is Israel. Israel has also a big carbapenemase production problem in all hospitals. So we wanted in 2014 to make, uh, under, to try to understand actually the dynamics of carbapenemase resistant pathogens. And we got support by the European Center for Disease Control in, in uh, Stockholm. And we called our project USCAPE, which stands for the European Survey of Carbapenemase Producing Enterobacteriaceae. And we went back to the good old friends that we have, the Sentinel laboratories that also provide the data for EARS, which are really representative um, for their own countries, because we've in, in included 20 hospitals per la for large countries, 15 for smaller countries, and so and so on. Um, to have a representative um, understanding of what happens in Europe. So in a six month period, we sampled from 36 countries, from 455 hospitals, 2,703 isolates, of which the majority were Klebsiella pneumonia and the, the very small minority E. coli. Because what we asked the whole laboratories to do is, he said, if you identify a carbapenem non-susceptible isolate, please put it in the box and then take the next comparator isolate that belong to the same species, regardless where it comes from, the main thing, it is an isolate uh, from your patients. So for every resistant isolate, we got a susceptible isolate. The highest prevalence, as we can could, uh, show, and which was also known, is in the Mediterranean and the Balkan countries. We published that in the Lancet Infectious Diseases last year. Just to give you an idea of the problems where we think uh, we could probably intervene, carbapenemase producing enterobacteriaceae in Europe is a problem of hospitals. These are the risk factors that we collected from the epi data mainly on intensive care units, and I'm sure that is what you see here as well. Patients that had previous hospital admissions are more likely to carry carbapenemase producers. So that's an already an indication that as patients grow and as patients in, in, go, uh, develop their patient career, if you like, they are more likely to 
to carry uh, highly resistant organisms. And then, of course, travel abroad may, be, may play a role because Mediterranean countries, after all, are a destiny for tourism in Europe. Northern Europeans like to go to the Mediterranean and what they bring back is souvenirs and cover panels. I'm going to, in the, for, for the um, sake of time, I'm going to skip this slide, which only shows you that on average we got half and half, half susceptible and half resistant ones, and that we got all the Kaba mazes that are known to cause problems also in Europe. These are all these colorful bars. Now, what I wanted to show you, and that is the important message really from today, is that we took the isolates and we sequenced them. And we did whole genome sequencing using next generation sequencing. Now, next, next generation sequencing is not that you can get the whole sequence easily. You just put the thing out and you get all your A, G, C, T, C, T, G, your sequence out there. It's a bit of a fiddle because the, the machines that allow you to do the sequencing up to now are still producing very small snips and snippets of sequences. And you have to combine them in a clever bioinformatic way. And you have to be very careful to not to make many mistakes there. And therefore, from the 2,300 or 2,500 isolates that we sequence, we only want to publish the results for 1,717 because we use very stringent quality criteria in order to trust our de novo assemblies. And it, they need, really need to be sort of a five-star rating assembly before we are trusting our own data. So this is why a lot of isolates were not put into the equation here. What we see here, and what, we, uh, what, what you see on the slide, is what we call a phylogenetic illustration of um, the, the genetic relatedness of all isolates. So if, genetic, if isolates are genetically very much related, they only differ by very few point mutations, they usually are displayed on a tree on very short branches, and they are near neighbors because they are brothers and sisters, right? And they have a common ancestor, which is not long ago. If the common ancestor is long ago, they are on very long branches. And that you can see here, you can see some are on very long branches, and some are on very short branches, which for example, this is, this looks like a broomstick with a lot of bristles on there. So a long stick, that means long trajectory from where it came from, but then a lot of isolates that are very, very similar. This is a successful clone. The colors indicate all the carbapenemases that we found, and you can see there's a group of very successful ones. They all contain KPCs, and I will come back to them, because they are of interest for you in Brazil as well. First, we had a look at combined resistance, and we said, what is cholestin resistance among these? And we found out that cholestin resistance virtually does not exist in carbapenemase susceptible isolates in Europe. Only 2% were cholestin resistant. However, once they are carbapenemase resistant, a quarter of them are cholestin resistant, probably reflecting the fact that doctors start to treat with cholestin. Now, this is the same illustration, and I'll show you a couple of different of the, of the same tree, only not as a circular dendrogram, but as a radial dendrogram. Now, here again, you see that many isolates are on very long branches, indicating that there is a whole diversity of Klebsiella in Europe, but some are actually at the end, these were sort of these broomsticks, at the end of a single branch, and then they divide into lots and lots, and they're very bushy. And I want to draw your attention actually to this part of the tree where there are lots of bushes up there and show you what this part of the tree really is. This is clonal complex 258. For all of you who knows about Klebsiella knows that sequence type 258 is the scorch. It's one of the problems that we face worldwide. And when you take this into a more geographic proportion where the problems are, namely in Italy, in Greece and in Israel, and you want to plot and see where on the dendrogram, where on the phylogenetic tree are isolates from these countries, it's very simple. They are only on a single branch. 
that is one single branch causes all, most all of the problem in Europe. And that's a phenomenon that I will describe later again, that very few causes all and most cause very little. Now this clone has obviously some special properties and these clones we use to call high risk clones. What is the hallmark of a high risk clone? It's defined by any of the following. They are either having an increased virulence, cause more disease, or, or and are more likely to be transmissible, more transmissible than others or have an increased tenacity. That means they are difficult to kill and probably survive environmental conditions, for example, in hospitals, better than others. On a phylogenetic tree, it's very easy to spot high-risk clones because I, I showed you already and you would know now forever know what a high-risk clone is. It's a broomstick with lots of bristles. So there are many. They are genetically related and they are geographically structured. That means the further you go away, the more genetic difference they develop. Now I want to really reflect on this group of the ST258 and ST512s. And if, remember the ST512s belong to the ST258s because they only differ by a single um, uh, locus. It's a single locus polymorphism out of the seven um, uh, uh, MLST loci. And these isolates that we had, we supplemented with the publicly available isolates from the global collection um, kept at the NCBI. So in the end, we looked at 651 isolates that all belonged to the same clonal complex. And we drew up this tree. And this tree tells you a lot about the population history of this clonal complex. How much time do I have left? OK, that's cool. If you look at the tree, you always have to look where are the long branches because the long branches indicate they have long evolutionary time spans. So things that are long branches probably are older in the sort of um, phylogenetic record. So if you look at the long branches here, they are all on the upper part of the tree. We call it its basal. If you should put it the other way around, then it would be basal indeed. But we put it on the top. Well, so most of the isolates with the long branches which are basal to the tree, from which the tree starts to grow, if you like, come from the United States of America. There are some introductions into Europe, but they were not very successful. A couple of introductions into the UK, to Poland, and also, it's not indicated here, we have two isolates. I have to put on my glasses, maybe I can spot them for you. They're somewhere here. You can see there's sort of the, something blue. There are two isolates from Brazil that are also very basal. So indicating probably in Brazil the problem was around at the time when in the problem started to emerge in the United States already. Maybe not big, but there were some. Then there was the first introduction into Greece, which is all these dark violet ones. I'm, I'm colored blind. I have difficulties with it. So don't take my color designations for real. Um, these are all the Greek isolates, and from the Greek isolates there are many that go into other European countries, indicating importation by travel. Then there is an introduction into Israel, and all these bright blue ones are from Israel, and in Israel, as I said, they had a huge outbreak there, of which no hospital was free, it was a nationwide epidemic. In Israel, the switch occurred between 258 to 512, and out of Israel, the isolates spread and were introduced into Italy and were very successful in Italy. Within no time, there was an outbreak which covered the whole of the uh, Italian peninsula. And out of Italy, again, through tourism, we now see spread into Belgium, into Austria, into the UK, and into Germany. 
This was not the first introduction into Italy. We at least see two other introductions, historic introductions into Italy, which have always been successful. So Italy is actually a country of promise for ST258, if you like. If we could now do the um, animated, that is excellent. Okay, I've now prepared you with the help of our technical friends here, a live demonstration of a tool that we have developed in order for you to use the whole genome sequences to the full extent of public health decision making. So you, in order to make sense out of that, you have to be able to play with the data and try to explore yourself. And when we publish this paper, this will all become open access. Now this is the same tree than the one that I just showed you, it's just the radial representation. You can change actually the representation of the trees if you like from, an, this was the one I showed you before, and you can change it back to the radial tree by clicking here, okay? So that is the radial tree. The tree is completely interactive with the map, so you can click on any of these branches and can highlight the branches, and that is the introduction into Italy, and then you can zoom into Italy using Google Map facilities and show where in Italy do you see which isolate, okay? But one of the interesting things that I really wanted to show you today is actually down here. We have a calendar of events that more or less replicates what probably have in happened in reality, but obviously there is a bias here. And the bias is which isolates have been isolated to be sequenced, and not all isolates get sequenced. So we will see countries that sequence more are overrepresented. So the first isolate from 2003 was from somewhere uh, near Washington, D.C. In 2004, there were more isolates from the east coast of the United States. This is 2005. You can see how these trees start to get populated with isolates on these long branches from the United States. And in 2006 and 2007, these become more. 2007 sees the first introduction into Israel. And it's 2008. In Israel, you see that this is well on the way to become an epidemic. 2009, you have the introduction into Italy. 2010, this starts to become more prominent in the United States, but also in Greece. In 2011, this is more in Israel. In 2012, it only starts to get more populous. And if you go all the way, you have the introduction into Italy, which within a matter of four years went from 4% of blood cultures being carbapenemase producers to 48% of carbapenemase production in blood cultures uh, from Klebsiella isolates. So now we go back to the slides, if I can. So you get the feeling of what you can use this for. You can play with it, and you can in the future use your own data and put it into the map and see where on the branch, where on the tree, your isolates would sit. So, having said that, we have looked in Italy into much more detail, and we looked into a single hospital and asked the question, in the hospital of Ancona, where on the tree are the susceptible isolates? And we found the susceptible isolates are actually very diverse, they are actually as diverse as global diversity, somewhere on the tree, scattered randomly. If we look at the resistant isolates, however, the non-susceptible, they're all next to each other, indicating that, this is, that the resistant isolates are transmitted. So this argument, by looking at that, we started thinking, hold on a second, we said, if we take this argument on its top, so flip it around and say, what proportion of isolates within a single hospital would be nearest neighbors if they were resistant compared to what proportion would be nearest neighbors if they were susceptible? And that is illustrated here. And I think this is the main message of the paper that we have submitted is Clearly, when you look at the same hospital, the probability, the proportion of nearest neighbors, that is the, the, the closest relative in the whole tree, is from the same hospital, 
of resistant isolates are found in the same hospital. And that sort of deteriorates when you go away from the hospital. In the distance of 100 kilometers, there's still a good proportion near neighbors in the distance of 300 hospitals and more, and then it disappears. Whereas in different countries, that changes. Now, we try to address the random error by just using um, bootstrapping analysis by actually randomizing um, country uh, geographical positions of all the hospitals and saying, well, what would be the probability to have a nearest neighbor if uh, there was no geographical signal by just mixing up all the hospital codes, and we did this 100 times in order to get for to a distribution, and that is what you expect if there was no geographical uh, signature in the, in the tree. You would expect that the proportion of resistant isolates would be just 0.7%, and not 52%, if there was no uh, geographic spread, if you like. Now that brings me to the conclusion of my talk, and that brings me actually to the reason why Carlos invited me. Um, we believe from the, geo from, the, from the molecular epidemiological data that the most important resistant bacteria are usually spreading within hospitals and then between hospitals. And the ones between hospitals are the ones in proximity. And we looked at that by analyzing patient movement data for the Netherlands. Doesn't become very clear. You see the Netherlands here, and you see the dots, the dots indicating hospitals. The blue dots are university, no, the red dots are university hospitals. The blue ones are teaching hospitals, and the small dots are just common, normal uh, district hospitals. And we got the data for all patient admissions per year. And we, with these data of all patient admissions, we created a map bringing together all the hospitals based on the numbers of patients that they exchange. So hospitals that exchange more patients get, get a bigger trajectory between them than hospitals that, and if I take that away, it's difficult to see, but you still see some of the uh, hospitals connected with the other hospitals and the big connectors are actually more patients exchanged than the small connectors. This is the Netherlands, but I wanted to draw your attention to a country which is bigger than the Netherlands, hence it has more authority, we have better data and more um, power to actually test our hypothesis. This is England, and we got the data for 10 years worth of, trans of hospital admissions for a country with 51 million inhabitants and for the financial year 2007, we stopped and we really took only for one year. And we had about 150 acute care hospitals. Some of them are university hospitals, but majority are smaller hospitals. And we had in that year 7.4 million patients treated in hospitals in England on 13 million occasions. As you can see, there are some patients that went more than once into a hospital. And these are the interesting ones. These are the ones that move between hospitals. So that network was constructed, and now this is not geographical. This is just based on the vicinity, bringing the hospitals into the vicinity of each other that exchange lots of, lots of patients. So that this is what we call a rubber band plot. When the, when the connectors are strong, they are drawn towards the center. And you see three, four things that I want to address with you. You see regional structure. This is Liverpool up in the north. This is Manchester. This is Birmingham, this is Bristol, this is London, this is Cambridge, this is Nottingham. And if you understand England ge English geography, you can see that already here, hospitals that are close to each other exchange more patients. They will not send the patients to Portsmouth. However, having said that, we have some hospitals which are always in the middle of these modular regional clusters, and these are the ones that are squares. These are university hospitals. They are sitting in the middle of their regional service structure, like a spider in the web. And they are very well connected among each other. And they are so good connected, they are very few but very well connected. And that is illustrated on this plot here. This plot is very important. 
because it shows you the connectivity by frequency. So most hospitals, this is the high frequency on the x-axis, most hospitals have very little connectivity with other hospitals. Whereas very few hospitals, frequency here, have a very high connecting weight. We plotted that on a bi-logarithmic scale and uh, the regression line is linear. If that's the case, that is a very interesting mathematical property. It is called scale freeness. And that is illustrating something that everybody of you already knows, that is like the distribution of wealth in a country, of income in a country, where 20%, if all goes well, for Brazil it would be probably 10%, own 90% of the income of a country, and the 90% rest share among themselves the 10% that is left of the country. That is a scale-free distribution. And the same scale-free distribution is in the English referral networks, where few hospitals have all the connectivity. And these are the university hospitals. So the structure is modular. That means uh, regional. It's hierarchical because you have a center. It's scale-free, I showed you that. And all scale-free systems have a property which is very funny. It's called the small world phenomenon. That is when you go to Hong Kong and you meet somebody you know, and you say, oh, it's a small world, right? I know the time is up and I will finish in 20 more seconds, sorry. No, it will be two minutes, sorry. To just Because I find this so important. In England, it takes four and a half referrals to go from any hospital in the United Kingdom to any other hospital in the United Kingdom. So if you are in Penzance, down in Cornwall in a hospital, on average it only needs four referrals to end up in Leeds in the very north. That's a small world phenomenon. That is typical for scale-free systems. That brings everything together so quickly, usually through the university hospitals. So we have healthcare regions and if they were not connected among each other, so this is the healthcare region of Bristol, this of Oxford, and obviously people are moving there, or in Oxford, even Oxford with Cambridge, although there is, of course, some hesitation between Oxford and Cambridge. If we did not have these super highways, we would only de deal with problems that are regional. And regional problems, and I'm not going for the sake of time into the explanation of this map. I want just to show you this because it's far more intuitive. If we do not exchange patients between Sao Paulo and Rio, between Sao Paulo and Recife, between Sao Paulo and Fortaleza, if you keep everything in Sao Paulo, it would look like this. Because this is also a hierarchical distributed system. This is a river system. So what you would get from the suburbs, you get patients that go to a regional hospital or to a health post, they will send to the regional hospital. From the regional hospital, they may, may end up in one of the university hospitals. And you, what you would see is only resistance that emerges in your catchment population will end up by definition in your university hospital. You all will end up in the university hospital, but you won't get the problems from Recife, right? Now, Italy is epitomal for a system where everybody who breaks a leg in Palermo, in Sicilia, will not go to the Sicilian hospital, but will, if he can afford it, go to Bergamo, or to Milano, or to Bologna, in order to be repaired there, because they trust the doctors in the north more than in the south. I come to my conclusion. That's my last penultimate slide, sorry. The current crisis of antimicrobial resistance is caused by transmission between patients within hospitals and between hospitals. It is not by the introduction from food, from animals or the environment. The problems that we see in hospitals have nothing to do with the cabapene mazes in shrimps that are grown in Vietnam. On a global scale, there are very few high-risk clones that are responsible for the problem. If we get control of these, we are actually doing a very good job. The high-risk clones have a propensity to increase their repertoire because they become many. 
And biological necessity means that by preferential attachment, they become more and more resistant, and they are becoming more and more transmissible. Understanding the spread of these clones requires an understanding of healthcare utilization patterns. How do patients move? With them, they move the isolates and these clones. And opportunistic pathogens serve as donor for MDR and XDR genes for obligate co uh, disease-causing pathogens. And I haven't shown you the slides because we have now reasons to believe that Salmonella typhi has acquired a CTXM14 in India, in Pakistan, and is now spreading. That's very worrying. That is my last message. We are in this together, independent if we are in Europe or South America. We should solve it together, and I'm optimistic. If we understand patient movement, we can solve it together. Thank you for your attention, and I'm open for questions. Thank you.